Welcome back to video lecture number eight. Hard to believe there's going to be a couple more dealing with the presidency in the coming days. But uh, today's lecture, we're going to take a look at the executive office of the president in this video lecture. So the goal of this lecture will be to address who actually assists a president in carrying out his duties. The president is one person, as you know very well by now, at the head of a sprawling and massive 2.8 million federal government enterprise, also known as the federal bureaucracy, a term we're going to encounter in a later lecture. It would be unthinkable and impossible for one person to oversee and manage all these people in all the different departments and agencies that make up the executive office in the executive branch. So be prepared to learn about the president's cabinet and also the president's staff consisting of White House aides who assist the president uh, in the executive office. Now, uh, let's start with this little fact. The executive office of the president, that is the EOP, executive office of the president, was formally established by Congress in 1939 to assist the president. As things had gotten complicated, the, the tasks uh, had multiplied over the years with regards to a president's duty, Congress gave the president more staff. So let's take a look at this executive staff and let me uh, zoom in here using my handy dandy control. So uh, let's just run over briefly, sorry about the topics covered, the goal of the cabinet and executive staff, cabinet versus senior staff aides, the executive office of the president, how presidents organize their staff, the White House office, and two things called the Office of Management and Budget and the National Security Council. So those are the five or six rather topics that we'll cover in this video lecture. Now let's get into this. Uh, let's look at the goals of the cabinet. That should be cabinet, not cabine, and executive staff. And here you see a picture of President Obama's staff meeting in the Oval Office of the West Wing. Uh, no matter how a president operates the executive branch, by cabinet or by staff, uh, the job of all the many people, 1,700 in all, who serve the president is to get the right people and the right information to the president in a timely fashion so that he can make the best decisions for the smooth functioning of the United States government and to promote and protect the interests of the American people. So the president has in all, as I said, about 1,700 people working for him. They gather information, they analyze it, they uh, boil things down into reports that then they present to the president who needs information to make decisions. So in short, presidents need to know a great deal about a lot of issues, uh, especially when they're being asked to make decisions, and presidents need to know options that are available to them, both the good and the bad, and the consequences of, of decisions that, a pres that they might make. And the opinions of his senior staff and cabinet members um, really are in influential and help presidents make those very difficult decisions. The senior staff and cabinet members also help the president communicate with the public uh, about different decisions, policy initiatives, um, goals, and actions that the president is taking. So that's a, a very, very important uh, uh, idea. So whether it be the cabinet or the executive staff, um, they are there to help the president um, conduct the business of the executive branch and to promote the interests of the United States and defend the Constitution. So let's move on. Cabinet versus aides. Well, many presidents come into office promising to organize the, the executive branch by cabinet government. Cabinet government. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the presidents will look to their cabinet secretaries, and secretary is the name of the leader of an executive cabinet, uh, or branch, or department, rather, excuse me, not branch, but department. Um, and there are 15 major departments. The Department of Defense, for example, the Department of State uh, is another, um, the Department of uh, Housing, the Department of Education, and so on and so forth. Each of these departments is headed by a secretary, and together the 15 uh, departments and the 15 secretaries make up a president's cabinet. And you can see here uh, in, in the picture a, pr a picture of President Ronald Reagan's cabinet meeting at the White House in the 1980s. Um, so this is one of the things that many presidents do. They're going to organize the executive branch and its work using 
primarily the cabinet. However, lately, presidents uh, have also begun to rely heavily on senior White House aides. Uh, and these are the people that serve the president directly, work with the president directly. They're people that the presidents uh, know and trust. Sometimes they help the president uh, get elected, worked on his election campaign. Uh, and, and so lately there's been a preference or decision by presidents to rely more on White House staff than cabinet leaders. Uh, and this is really because the White House aides work closely with the president day to day, and they're 100% loyal to the president. Otherwise, they wouldn't be where they are. Uh, whereas, in contrast, cabinet secretaries do not interact with the president on a daily basis. And cabinet leaders run their own departments independently of the president, though they're following the president's goals and ideas. So they represent, uh, that is, cabinet secretaries represent a broader range of responsibilities. They interact with the public uh, more frequently than, than maybe White House aides do. Um, so this, this really kind of explains why presidents have chosen uh, lately, in the last 20 years maybe, to use, uh, rely more on their White House aides. Um, so I hope that answers that question. How are aides and cabinet secretaries different? Um, and we got into that. So let's take a look. Uh, and I can just add this, that recent presidents, including President Obama, avoid cabinet government and rely on their close circle of trusted advisors. So is that good news or bad news? I don't know. What do you think? Uh, in your notes, list reasons why it might be good to rely on cabinet government or executive office or why it might be bad. Why would it be good for a president to rely on his staff to organize the executive department or why would it be bad? So you can pause this video lecture and respond to those questions in your notes. Thank you. So let's move on to topic number three. Uh, we're back after you answered those questions. The Executive Office of the President. Uh, we already said that it was created in 1939 in an attempt to ensure the President had adequate staff to support the operations of the Executive Branch. So why did it take so long? That is from 1789, the first President, Washington, to 1939 to create this expanded Executive Office. Well, we need to look to the demands of an increasingly complex and global world. And these were already visible in the 1920s and 1930s. So Congress responded by giving the president more staff. And we look at the Great Depression, there was World War I, the Roaring Twenties. However, then there was a stock market crash followed by a depression. So uh, the president was more and more involved in his executive office, was more and more involved in the day-to-day -day affairs of the nation. So he got more staff. Uh, we also had the World War breaking out in 1939 and 1940, and that was going to uh, place increasing demands on the president, so the executive staff is created. And we need to look at some of the uh, offices and positions in the executive um, uh, branch, and those include um, the White, at the White House in particular, the Chief of Staff, the National Security Council, the White House Office, the Office of Management and Budget, Budget, the Council of Economic Advisors, the Office of U.S. Trade Representative, the Office of Science and Technology, and these are only the biggies, so there, there are more, and you see some of them listed there on your screen in case you could not capture them all. But the idea is that uh, these folks, and again, they total about 1,700 professionals who work closely with the president, and they help him work and interact with Congress and congressional leadership. They meet with interest groups that are all over the place. They deal with the media, a very important function uh, for the president to get his message out and or to respond to things going on in society. And they also work and meet with the public. Um, so the executive office of the president, you can see sort of a chart there that outlines, again, some of those positions if you could not catch them. So let's move on to the next topic. And that is, how do presidents organize their executive staff? Well, each president is free to organize his staff as he wants. Historically, there have been two real approaches, the bicycle wheel approach on one hand, or the hierarchical top-down approach. And you can see the symbols there, uh, images that represent each approach. President FDR adopted the bicycle wheel approach, and that means that each spoke of the wheel represents a senior advisor who reports to the president, who is the hub of the wheel. And FDR was clever because he assigned overlapping tasks and responsibility to multiple advisors so that he would never be dependent on information from one advisor alone. Pretty smart, no? Presidents Truman, Kennedy, Johnson, 
Carter and Clinton followed the bicycle wheel approach to organizing their staff. President Eisenhower in the 1950s, however, used a hierarchical design. He was a general in the military, so it's not surprising in which lines of authority and communication were clearly drawn, and they start at the top, the president's chief advisors on down, and they report to the president who is at the top of that pyramid. So the most dominant and powerful aide uh, was the chief of staff, who served really as a gatekeeper to the president. President Nixon, President George W. Bush followed this model. Uh, and in addition, we'll see later that President Bush gave an outsized role to his Vice President Dick Cheney. Um, president Obama uh, and his Vice President Joe Biden, on the other hand, uh, really doesn't have the same role that Dick Cheney did. Uh, president Obama, I believe, uh, tends to use more of a bicycle wheel approach, though. He, too, uh, has, has decided to go the route of using his trusted senior advisors and he has multiple senior advisors in his close inner circle so he too I think follows more of the bicycle wheel approach. We can look at the size of the White House office and that varies from president to president. President George Bush had 400 people working in his White House whereas President Nixon in the 70s had over 600. But this is this is clear the chief of staff is the key member inside the White House and he or she manages really the day-to-day -day operations of the White House office and staff in addition to also providing key advice to the president both in domestic and foreign uh, areas. Another key member of the president's White House office is the press secretary and it is that person who gets out the president's message to the press pretty much on a daily basis, daily press briefings in the White House. And that's an important function in our hyper-connected, fast-paced world. So let's move on to the next topic, a quick look at the OMB and NSC. Uh, the Office of Management and Budget, as you remember, dates to 1921. We saw that in a previous lecture. And it was moved to the Executive Office of the President in 1939. And in 1970, it was given its current name. The OMB has the job of assisting the President in preparing an annual budget, which is a huge task, performing also the central legislative function to ensure that legislative priorities and goals of the 15 departments and the 140 agencies are in line with the President's program and goals for a given year that he announces in the State of Union address. And the, the OMB also monitors the implementation of different programs uh, and, and actions by uh, taken by departments and agencies to ensure efficiency and cost effectiveness. So this is a really huge job and it's a big responsibility. And the OMB is in many ways responsible uh, for the federal government doing what the President wants and uh, making sure that the laws passed by Congress and signed by the President are being implemented and followed. So really a big job. The National Security Council, on the other hand, was established in 1947 and it was created in the post-World War II era that we now know as the Cold War. And the Security Council coordinates the collection and analysis of data that relates to our national security. Um, the National Security Council advises the President on policy formulation relating to national security, so it could be domestic and or foreign. And the issue, that, however, that, that we've seen over the years since the NSC was created is the temptation for the uh, NSC uh, to go beyond its stated role of analysis and advising uh, the President to actually implementing policy and carrying out actions initiated from the executive branch and we already have discussed the idea of the president initiating hostilities uh, without a congressional declaration of war so we really see that the NSC is this council that uh, gathers information advises the president but now has become uh, increasingly involved in actions and that is a sticky area from a constitutional point of view is it not so, um, what do you think about that? Is, is this something that we need to investigate more, this idea of the National Security Council and its actions? And I'll just leave you with this. During President Nixon's time in office, again, the late 60s, early 70s, the National Security Affairs Advisor, a man by the name of Henry Kissinger, Henry Kissinger, and I'd like you to know that name, exercised more influence and power than even the Secretary of State in determining American foreign policy during the Vietnam War. Uh, America was involved in several bombings that went beyond Vietnam into neighboring Cambodia and Laos, and then uh, 
Nixon, or, uh, Nixon relied on Kissinger to begin peace talks uh, to end that war, uh, not using the Secretary of State and diplomatic channels uh, as one might have expected, but using his National Security Council. So that ends this lecture. Please jot down any questions. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.